All right, good morning and welcome to 2022 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment Session. Creating equity using quality improvement to make measurable difference interventions from the Create and Equity Collaborative. My name is Hannah Endeff, and I'm, I am a brand chief within HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau's Division of Community HIV AIDS Programs, and I will be serving as your moderator today. We thank you for joining today's session. As you participate in the session, please feel free to add your questions or comments in the chat box. At the conclusion of the session, the presenters will have the opportunity to address your questions. Let us begin. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our um, workshop today. Um, the title for today's uh, workshop is Creating Equity Using Quality Improvement to Make a Measurable Difference. And what we really want to do today is to introduce you to our Create Equity Collaborative, share some of the best practices and focus specifically on some of the intervention we used. And I'm one of three presenters. Um, that we are very excited to, um, to have you and to present the information to you. I am Clement Steinbach. I am the director for the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation. I'm very excited to have you. Uh, Lisa, do you wanna quickly introduce yourself and then ask Michelle to do the very same? Sure, my name is Lisa Reed. I'm the vice president of grant funded clinical services at Sun River Health located in New York State and happy to be here. Hi, I'm Michelle Pendle, and I am a public health specialist with the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation. Wonderful. So uh, let's get going. You'll hear from all three of us throughout this presentation. So on the next slide, you will see um, that uh, myself, Clemens, Lisa, and Michelle have no relevant financial interest to disclose. Next slide. So I want to give you a broader sense about what is CQII, which stands for Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation, is all about. We are a cooperative agreement funded by HRSA, HIV AIDS Bureau. And, um, and really our mission is to improve HIV care using quality improvement and technical assistance. And you see here in our, um, on the slide, our mission statement. Next slide, please. The collaboratives are one of probably four levels of technical assistance available to you. Um, so all of our invite funded um, providers um, and individuals living with HIV have the opportunity to take advantage of our CQII offerings. Um, we provide, um, if you see on the slide on the lower left, there's, we develop quite a bit of uh, quality improvement resources that are available. They're all available at no cost to you uh, through our website. Um, so if you simply go to cqii.org, you will be redirected to our page at a Target HIV site. We also uh, present co conferences, workshops like this at various conferences. And also, we, um, if you want to be added to our mailing list, we will send you our monthly announcements and many other resources that we um, share with our Rheinwald uh, colleagues. Um, further up the chain here, we have quality improvement trainings. We offer not only face-to-face -face trainings, but also online tutorials that are available um, to you to learn about um, quality improvement and increase your QI proficiency. One of the offerings we have in writing training are monthly webinars that you can join us. We also provide at no cost technical assistance um, through our pool of nationally recognized uh, quality improvement content experts. And lastly, and we're gonna to focus today a little more is in our collaborative um, learning, uh, which is our community of, of learning kind of technical systems level. Next slide, please. So today um, we wanna describe some of the interventions that were conducted by Ryan Wright recipients and sub-recipients just like you to work toward ending the disparities in, in HIV care and um, we're very excited to um, share um, and ask uh, Lisa to share her experiences and her intervention activities that she has done as part of her program. And we want to invite you to learn a little bit more um, about, to learn about these interventions 
so that how we can assist busy providers like you to mitigate HIV disparities. And then lastly is about where you can find other resources available to you and others. Next slide. So I want to start out with um, uh, a lot, um, while there's only 3% is today, um, this really took a village of lots of providers, patients with HIV, our fund at the HRSA uh, HIV AIDS Bureau to be part of our journey over the last 18 months. Um, and this is really important to share with you that this is important that it, quality improvement takes a village, it takes a team. And so I want to thank um, all our participants, our faculty, our um, those individuals with uh, lived experience to be part of our team. Next slide, please. And so you see here uh, many names here, and I just want to thank um, all of them for the continued support and staff. And um, and I also want to really thank all of them and also thank our participants in the collaborative. You will hear from Lisa about her experience. Next slide. So what was this collaborative all about? You know that you see here the logo, it's creating equity. And um, we did some focus groups about why a busy program, why a busy brand might program would join yet another activity to improve care. And if you go to the next slide, you will see a little bit some of the um, hopes and dreams for when we started this collaborative. And you see here some quotes of participants um, from our last collaborative, but I think it came down to probably four elements. Um, one is to learn the best practices from your peers. And the power of peer learning is very evident um, when you bring providers together, learn from content experts and hear what they have done and be inspired by what other ones have done. I think the second driver for participating in this and many other activities is to have access to evidence-informed or emerging practices. And rather than reinventing the real, you know what other folks are doing so you can learn from them and really have a written manual to follow. And that would, that would be the second driver. The third one, I think, to have um, really impacting the HIV community that you serve locally or collectively nationally, and to really make a measurable um, um, difference. And lastly, is to really collaborate and foster connection. The ability that often we hear that um, when you do quality improvement, you have this kind of lonely ranger um, approach, and but rather you have the ability to collaborate with others and foster those connections for networking and exchange. Next slide. So that really triggered um, our creation of our Create Equity Collaborative. And I think it was really important to point out our mission statement that was really about improving or promotes the application of quality improvement interventions to make a measurably um, increase the virus suppression rate for people with HIV. And, and those um, individuals experienced the impact of social determinants of health. And in our case was related to housing instabilities, substance use, mental health, and age. Um, and we invited Ryan Wright providers, whether they were recipients or sub-recipients, sub to join our journey. With that, um, we're going to turn it over to Michelle to give us a little bit more about some of the things, um, some of the resources that were available for this collaborative. Yes. Okay. So first we have the Target HIV website, which is where you can find all of the resources that were created for the Create Equity Collaborative. Um, it also has the change packages that were put together for the intervention, uh, for the affinity groups that contain the interventions for the different groups. And we also have templates for the community partners to use. On this page, you can see our Create Equity Flyer, which is basically like a brief summary of the collaborative. We have the toolkit, which is the ins and outs of the collaborative, the timelines, expectations, basically everything about it is in this toolkit. And then we also have the literature, literature review that was done to identify um, the social determinants of health that the collaborative is focusing on. Here we have some videos from our lived experience experts that are both faculty and participants in the collaborative, uh, talking about the different social determinants of health that we're focusing on, as well as their experience within the collaborative. Here is an example of one of our benchmark reports that we put together after every submission cycle, where we compare um, 
the viral suppression rates from the different affinity groups, as well as the overall caseload. We also look at the screening and intervention measures that participants report every two months. And on the right, we have the landing page for the Create Equity Database, which is where participants would submit their data. And on the database, they have the ability to do their own benchmarking so they can compare their data to their earlier data and see how, they've, how far they've come, or they can compare data to other participants in the collaborative. Here is an example of a driver diagram that was provided to participants so that they could do their own and figure out what intervention would work best for them based on the issues that they were experiencing. And then on the right, we have an example of one of the change packages for the housing affinity group. And then now Clemens will be discussing the interventions that were some of the interventions that were chosen by our participants. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, just for those who want to um, access those resources, if you can go to cqii.org um, and then click on our Create Equity, many of those resources that you have seen here in previous slides are accessible to you. Um, we encourage you to, as uh, we often say, steal shamelessly and share senselessly the idea that um, take advantage of what other um, have done before you, take advantage of them. And many of them may really help you on your journey. Um, just to be sure to um, highlight what, before we go into intervention is that we we really focused on four disparities that we, are, that we really knew about and we really wanted to focus on. We certainly recognize there are many more social determinants of health that um, are hindering the access to and reaching optimal outcomes for people with HIV but we felt that housing, mental health, substance use, and age across the lifespan was really an important, important driver. And we wanted to start there and create opportunities, certainly for taking those lessons learned and apply them to other social determinants of health. So let's go to the um, next slide. And we want to show and highlight um, with you a little bit some of the interventions that we really pinpointed to us is very important. So what's an intervention? An intervention is for us a um, described activity that we know from the literature and your peers that they will lead to improved health outcomes and or reduce the gap between a, sub, a specific subpopulation and everyone else served by the same program. And one of the criteria for including in our intervention listing and case conferencing is one of them is that we could find evidence in the literature that they are beneficial and they benefit um, individuals with HIV. And secondly, there were described steps to implement them. And I would just want to acknowledge the, the work that we have done with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, that helped us to really think through what the interventions were and then um, brought them together. So the first one I wanna introduce is case conferencing. I think we all know at some level um, what case conferencing is, which is basically a multidisciplinary team uh, meets and review specific patients that meet certain criteria, whether they are not virally suppressed, whether they have um, a substance use disorder um, or uh, we have other challenges. And to really think through for multiple lenses about um, what they can do in the case conflict intervention. You can access the, the intervention as well as a, a manual how to do it uh, on our website. And it was really about, um, here are some successful strategies. We also include in our manual a best practice that was done as part of our uh, one of our programs that participated in. It's basically, it's important that they're regularly scheduled and standardized. So there's a form available how to document case conferences and to move forward. And it's clearly important to have multiple perspectives. And then also about, uh, usually the meetings are one hour long. And so we suggested to have at least three to four cases being discussed and really pinpoint the next steps for this intervention. So that was one that was commonly used. Um, and one that we found in the literature that there was not necessarily a manual available. So we actually used our collective wisdom to actually write a manual, which, is, which can be found on our website. Next slide. So optimal linkage and referral. Um, we all know how important it is 
that um, to really have active referral is one thing to say to a client to see different services that one single provider cannot provide. Um, in particular for newly diagnosed, often to navigate the system is very complicated and that probably applies to all of us. And also the ability to, if you fall out of care, how to be relinked. And so this active referral intervention was a very important one. And I think to my knowledge, the, the one that was, that was um, the one most frequently used across all the different participants in our collaborative. And so it was to be, um, to really think through from the lens of our patients about how we can remove the structural barriers and um, the increased social support services. Also the focus on using peers in active referral, um, often a provider uh, can do their part, but often a peer can help them to, to better understand, maybe there's a greater openness to ask questions uh, when a peer helps you with linkage and referral. And also we uh, pointed some, some questions about appointment scheduling, timer and active referral. So that's an inter, uh, a, a very important intervention. We all know this is a very critical step in um, for getting patients involved in care and also to avail um, ongoing services. Next slide, please. Undetectable program. I think we all know um, that the, the U equals U, the important part um, to understand for people with HIV, that um, if you're virally um, suppressed, you cannot transmit HIV um, to somebody else who um, um, so that sexual um, activities. And it's a really important, it's a very um, deliberating and, and, and um, step. And so the idea was about really um, helping um, peer to peer to really help and some of the things here, uh, activities that are part of this package of intervention is not using um, gift, and, gift incentives, you know, cognitive behavioral approaches, directly observed therapy and others. So there was a whole package as part of this undetectable program that you can read up on our website. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uber Health, um, very important. And this could be certainly applied to any other um, shared drive services, we know that la lack of transportation is often in whether it's urban or rural, a, a barrier to care. And um, finding an arrangement for, um, for medical transportation and Uber Health, and it could be also for other services. Um, and so we, we, we found that a very important service that can be particularly those that face barriers um, whether they cannot afford transportation, whether they could not make it because no transportation available. And so that um, intervention was very helpful to really facilitate and address that barrier. Next slide, please. Walk-in availability and open access. I know that sometimes when we work in our um, clinics that you know, we, we, we need to go by a certain schedule that works for us as providers. But that same schedule may not work for the for the patients we see, and so that the idea was in, as part of this intervention is how can we increase the walk-in availability, or even go a step further to open access. Open access is the idea that patients can come when they are ready, and not necessarily on Monday at three to three thirty, and so that was um, uh, particular for those that are marginalized patients particularly for those that um, face lots of barriers. I think that's a really important and hopefully sends a message of welcoming them back to the program. Next slide. So this is, uh, and there are many more interventions. I think we have a dozen, if not more available. Some were, um, we, we, we did a literature review and then grouped them and wrote manuals for many of them. And so here you see a list again, uh, the full list uh, can be accessed on our website at cqi.org. Um, take advantage of the many resources, do not reinvent the wheel and um, take advantage of what, what is out there already. With that, I think I would turn it back over to Michelle. So now I'll be discussing the reach of the collaborative. 
Uh, so we had 83 community partners across 28 states and territories, representing at least 94 individual agencies enrolled. Uh, they serve collectively 222,000 people with HIV, served by all the community partners. And then within the identified subpopulations, there was almost 50,000 people with HIV. And then as of June 2022, we still have 60 community partners still active. Here is a map of all of our participating agencies. The darker the color, the more agencies that are participating. So we had a lot of representation in Texas, California, and Pennsylvania. Here is a timeline of the collaborative activities. So we started with an orientation session and informal affinity sessions and QI coaching sessions. So that way uh, participants could get to know their QI coach and also meet other affinity group faculty. We had four learning sessions, 94 affinity sessions. Um, and here is affinity group session attendance over time. Um, we had an average of 37 participants per affinity session over all 94 sessions. And then our collaborative goals was to reach one in six Ryan White HIV AIDS program funded recipients across the United States and have them actively participate in the collaborative. We were able to reach 14% of all Ryan White recipients. Um, we were able to reach 95,100 people with HIV or 27% of all Ryan White HIV AIDS program patients receiving medical care, which is also one in every four Ryan White patients. Um, one in 13, and also one in 13 people with HIV in the US were also reached by the collaborative. So this is a quote from one of our participants about the sense of community. So I really enjoy the collaboration across the country. So really it's that sense of community, I think, and the shared learning that we are able to do from each other. I think that's my favorite part. Uh, here is the viral suppression data over time from March to the end of the collaborative. There was an there was a decrease in the number of, of people who are not virally suppressed by 27%. Here we have the affinity group specific viral suppression rates over time, which increased on average by 6.5% with the housing affinity group uh, having the largest increase of 12.9%. Here is the difference between first and last submission. So again, housing one by a lot. <laughs> um, so comparing their first and last agency viral suppression data submission, they had an increase of 15.3%. And then of course, the main goal of the Create Equity Collaborative was to create equity. So to do that, we wanna reduce the viral suppression gap between the overall caseload and the identified subpopulation. And we were able to do that as well on average by 6.4% across all the affinity groups. And then here is another quote from one of our participants. I think that sense of community and that you don't have to do this by yourself, you've got lots of support, but they also expect a lot of you. You're going to be called. You have to be paying attention. That's really good. Then just a mixture of people. There's so many diverse voices that come together as part of these collaboratives and that's priceless really. So next, back to Clements. Thank you. And hopefully you you saw in the, in the last slide that Michelle presented that there's evidence that we are able to, to reduce the gap, to, to work towards equity. And we also saw from the data that some of them regarding housing, mental health substance use, there's still work to be done. But we hope that you walked away from, from this collaborative or hearing about this collaborative that we were able to make uh, a measurable improvement. And we hope certainly hope to publish the data in the, in the months and uh, months to come. It is my great pleasure um, to really thank uh, Lisa and her team, who are one of the really superstars of our collaborative um, at Sun River Health in New York State. And I will invite uh, Lisa um, to share a little bit about what they have done um, and talk a little bit about your experience. And, and so we're looking forward to hear that. And I just wanted to thank you, Lisa, and your team for participating and really making a difference in, in your community. Lisa. Well, thank you, Clemens, and thank you to uh, CQII as well as HRSA to allow us today to present from Sun River Health. Um, next slide. So Sun River Health is a network of federally qualified community health centers in New York State. We cover a, a wide region from down the Hudson Valley all through New York City and then out to the tip of Long Island. 
Um, the organization serves around 230,000 patients annually, and of those patients, around 2,360 are Ryan White patients. Of the 43 sites that we have, 16 of them have integrated HIV, Hep C services, along with primary care, women's health, medication-assisted treatment, and behavioral health. So um, our Ryan White um, grant services, the Hudson Valley um, and the New York City regions. So for this QI project through CQII, we focused on two of our sites in the Bronx that were really struggling with viral load suppression rates. And they were in Inwood and the Hub, and they serve combined around 600 patients. They're located five miles apart in a very densely populated region with high rates of poverty, substance use disorder, um, mental illness, and homelessness. And so you can see where the social determinants of health truly impacted viral load suppression. Next slide. So we looked at our data as we are trying to deduce where the barriers were from um, with viral load suppression. And we noted that the mental health burden was five to 10% higher in the Bronx than in our other two regions. And the rate of substance use disorder among persons living with HIV was twice that in the Bronx than the other two regions. And so it became very clear that it would um, be a good intervention to implement looking at embedding a harm reduction approach um, within primary care. Next slide, please. So our goal was to improve the viral load suppression rate for those individuals HIV positive and um, having a substance use disorder by 15% over the 18 month period and to also maintain the um, prescription rates for ART and we're currently at, at 98%. So we really looked at this intervention and as, as Clement said, you get a manual. And so it's very easy to follow the process, bring it to your team and use this manual as a guide to implement. So it really takes a lot of the work out of it for those of us trying to implement something new. So we looked at the elements of, um, and principles of the harm reduction approach, and we really felt that it supported our mission and that it would be a good fit for us. And so we used this, um, this pictorial diagram of the, the living tree from the Harm Reduction Coalition, kind of um, representing the project so that we really were trying to create this nurturing environment of that living lush tree with um, you know, clear communication and patient-centered care um, as opposed to that withered uh, kind of dying tree. Um, next slide, please. So as we began to implement the intervention, our first step was to conduct a kickoff event and invited individuals from uh, across disciplinary group throughout those two sites to really look at what were the main drivers in um, impacting viral load suppression. And I would highly suggest utilizing the driver diagram tool when utilizing um, a new QI project. When we implemented this, um, a large group of people came together and really brainstormed. And we looked at these different categories to say, what would we need to build in order to really impact the viral load suppression? So we looked at data, how would we need to um, create structured data within the EMR to um, gather the information for statistics to track substance use um, disorders and viral load suppression. And, and then we looked at staff training. How could we improve staff knowledge and skills through a myriad of training, um, also patient engagement, how to evaluate the groups that we are doing with patients, and how to really engage them, obtain their, their comments and their real participation and how could we improve um, services, also bringing it to our consumer advisory committee. 
And how would we change that tone and that environment and culture of the organization through different structures, through signage, through creating a welcoming environment? And then administratively, how would we also um, build leadership support, um, have policies and procedures, job descriptions, and other documents to really support the principles of harm reduction? So overall, I would say this, this event, bringing everyone together to brainstorm was really a wonderful way to um, build unity and have a shared goal and really built enthusiasm for the project. Next slide. So some, from there, we really felt that we needed to implement a variety of trainings across all disciplines and across all um, kind of ranges of that visit with the staff that a patient encounters to really change that, the knowledge and skill base of the staff. And so we looked at those principles as we were implementing um, this intervention. And so we looked at those in, to see where they were reflected within our program. And so that humanity Humanism was reflected in some of the training that we did around language of caring and de-escalation. So really giving people the skills to utilize verbal and nonverbal communication um, as they were interacting with patients. Um, pragmatism, we looked at our communication during our case conferences as we described patients' behavior and, and change expectations. And then autonomy, incrementalism, accountability without term, fear of termination was really reflected in how providers prescribe medications, um, how we have the integrated works between departments and shared decision making. Next slide. So as Clemens alluded, these um, regularly scheduled learning sessions really helped us to drive our um, data collection and our initiative. And so it really, they helped to keep us on point, kept us focused. Um, and those meetings were a resource for us as we were implementing each stage of the project. So we utilized our QI coaches to find CME and non-CME trainers for the variety of staff that we felt we needed to be training. And we really look to incorporate the principles of harm reduction throughout all of the different projects that we were working on, whether it was trauma-informed care, stigma prevention, to really have it be uniformly implemented um, throughout our, um, our work environment. And then as we were presenting throughout that 18 months, we would get feedback from the other members of the collaborative which really helped us to look at some of the challenges, um, as well as feel like there are other people with the same struggles and getting best practices from folks. And so one of the recommendations that we got from one of our project, um, one of our presentations was to look at ways to um, reduce our challenges around engaging um, patients and retaining them in care at our Inwood site. And the suggestion was made to look at doing an art group with individuals and to have them create artwork that depicted what helped them stay engaged with their care team and what helped them suppress their viral load. Next slide. So we brought this back to the team and we brought it to the community advisory committee. And the consumers really liked the idea and felt that this was a, a great way to engage people in something that was really positive. And so they made lots of other suggestions about how we could utilize the artwork. Um, and the hope is really that we will be able to put all of this artwork together, show it in a PowerPoint and have it on um, television screens in the waiting rooms. Um, the consumer advisory committee suggested doing poetry and music throughout with some messaging in between the art pieces. And I think people were really excited to do something new and different. And so one of our peer adherence educators, um, Elizabeth, who is very crafty and uh, volunteered to facilitate the group. And so she's been running a group on a monthly basis um, that's open to all of our participants. 
Um, next slide, please. And so they we provided multimedia um, artwork um, and art supplies to create their artwork. And it was really inspiring to see the messages that people um, came up with. So continue through, please. So people brought their culture um, and their, their artistic abilities. Next slide. And we really got a variety of really positive messages that we're hoping that will be inspiring for other people as they view the slide PowerPoint. It's also been um, a great way to have patients bond with one another, um, provide and receive support as they're you know, creating this artwork. Next slide. And one of the days we had someone come in who was really struggling with some of the news that she had gotten in her medical appointment. And she gave us permission to share her story and her picture today. And she at first declined coming to the group, but then decided she would come. And her response really um, validated the importance of doing some projects like this. And she said that after participating in the group for an hour, she felt much more um, focused and able to deal with the information that she had been given and, um, and, and much less stressed. And so we really have shared that story with many of the other patients to um, really try to encourage them to participate as well. Next slide. We then um, started displaying the artwork in our Serenity Room at the Inwood site. And we've also branched out to the other regions to also share this project so that we can really start to gain artwork from all of the um, health centers. Next slide. So um, the consumer um, group had suggested doing some sip and paints. So we got some sparkling cider and of course refreshments. And, um, and so then the, the Hudson Valley and the Suffolk regions also participated in, in completing artwork. Next slide. And it's really been pretty powerful seeing the messages that people chose to share. U equals U. Um, everybody's talking about injectables as we start to implement that and, and really you know, keep aspiring. So it's great to have these messages. Next slide. This individual talked about um, being diagnosed 32 years ago and have had two children while positive. Um, I've realized that a good team and a great provider makes all the difference. And so we're really hoping that as someone is in the waiting room and seeing these messages that they too will feel inspired and can then also participate in the art project as well. Next slide. So this was just one of the parts of our project, but as we implemented um, the harm reduction intervention, we really looked at focusing on organizational system change for sustainability. So we obtained you know, leadership um, support from the get-go. We also have had an integrated medication-assisted treatment program throughout New York City based on the high level of substance use disorder across those sites. And so there was really a lot of support for the training and um, skill development and increasing knowledge among the staff. So that was certainly a big help. But we also found that we needed some systems that people were going to be getting ongoing education, particularly with staff turnover. So we developed an orientation process for all of the clinical staff, which would include HIV prep, hep C, harm reduction and naloxone training so that everyone coming in new and on an annual basis would get a refresher so that we could continue to drive home the importance of those principles and that they supported the mission of the organization. We um, also incorporated um, harm reduction education into all of our um, ongoing assessments, staff training. We do an annual conference for all of our specialty staff. And so there's ongoing training um, throughout the year. It was really important to build harm reduction into the structured data 
into the templates that providers and support staff use um, and really look at those kind of permanent fixtures so that one, it was being reinforced, but it also provided the guidance of the type of questions that we wanted um, staff to be asking patients. Um, we've also added um, harm reduction into all of the other staff training, um, the training plans that we have for peers, case managers, and adherence nurses. We've done a number of things organization-wide to also kind of provide for this staff self-care. And so we do short rounds, which provides providers and staff an opportunity to talk about difficult cases. We also do Plain Tree retreats. Um, Plain Tree is an international certification based on patient-centered care. And so we've created a process of celebrating staff success throughout the year. And so on a monthly basis, um, a different group of employees is recognized. There's a, a photo menage and music, and then all of the leadership um, join together in providing accolades around those departments and the accomplishments throughout the year. And particularly during the pandemic, it's been so important to really um, recognize all of the tasks that people have been doing going above and beyond, whether it was you know, COVID testing and COVID vaccination clinics, now monkeypox clinics. So um, people have really had to stretch and learn new skills to continue their, their jobs. And so it's really important to be recognizing that and acknowledging it. We continue to work at, on improving workflows because as things change, we had to constantly be adjusting to the changes of the pandemic um, and you know, developing new resources and toolkits as we were moving along through this project. We've also done a number of environmental changes, looking at the signage, um, taking feedback from consumers and making it a more welcoming and friendly environment. We, um, we really did try a number of different training opportunities, um, whether it was language of caring, that was a train the trainer program that we implemented agency-wide. We used a number, number of trainings through the AETC, uh, motivational interviewing, harm reduction, and a number of kind of offshoots. And then our medication-assisted treatment program implemented a lunch and learn training. And so we collaborated with them to have some shared topics and shared speakers. So that it was really um, kind of building the team by pulling other groups into our project as we had um, mutual goals. Um, and we also did that with our trauma-informed care project. Next slide. So there were not many challenges and barriers um, throughout the time period, which we needed to um, address. And certainly one being that we had to really recognize that change takes time. And in order to create that change, we really needed to um, mirror and, and demonstrate that change. And so we really looked at creating things that were gonna be there for the long haul. Um, and staff turn, turn up, turnover during the pandemic was certainly a hindrance. Um, we have about 2000 staff and at one point in the height of the pandemic, we had 400 openings. And so you can imagine the strain on the existing staff. And thankfully we have kind of gotten over that hump, but we really had to adjust um, our implementation. And because we were constantly adjusting to the changing um, workflows and the procedures, um, we had to adjust our project as well. And so sometimes things had to take a back seat in order to get some other things in place first. As always, there are competing interests as people have multiple projects to be implementing. And so um, sometimes it was difficult to get people to join new meetings or trainings um, and take on new tasks. We also went through a very big merger um, in 2019. And so the New York City sites merged with the parent company. 
And so as with any merger, there was really ongoing changes with integration of systems, which really um, increased a, it was a larger learning curve for things to just operationally continue. I think it was really important um, to recognize that we needed to stay, take stock of the importance of the project and to um, take time to celebrate those small successes as they occurred to keep the momentum and the enthusiasm um, going. Next slide. So patient um, feedback and participation was key throughout this project. Um, in the early days, we kicked off with some focus groups to really find out what patients thought about the quality of the services that we were rendering. And we asked them um, a series of questions that were standardized and a part of this intervention that were given to us, which made it, made it very easy. And so we had about a dozen people in each of the focus groups. And overall, they, they said they felt very comfortable talking about their substance use with their provider as well as their sexual health. And they felt that they were supported. The provider acknowledged their um, achievements um, and they really didn't feel judged. For the most part, they felt that, you know, if they had any issues, they could raise it with their provider. Um, they, could, they could speak freely without fear, fear of being terminated from the practice. Um, and they did give us some areas where they felt that staff could benefit from more training around harm reduction and the way they addressed patients or the workflow to make it feel more personal and welcome. And so those groups were invaluable to really help us move forward with this project. It was also um, really important for the staff to see the importance that patients placed they were very appreciative of the fact that we were holding these groups and asking them, what do you think about your care? How would you like us to improve it? And that we were taking their input, bringing it to leadership, and we were gonna utilize it in this project to create change. And so although we all talk about um, patient and consumer um, satisfaction and feedback, I think it's these kinds of moments that, that solidify it for the staff and you really recognize how val valuable it is to the program and to the individuals to be able to have a voice. So in addition to the, um, the focus groups, we also had peers very involved in the, the whole step of the way um, in the driver diagram, in doing um, presentations to the cab. They, facilitated the, um, the groups that we started and um, the art groups. And one of the things that had come out of the focus groups is that they wanted psychoeducation groups and they wanted support groups. And they, had, they voiced this. And so we immediately put that in place so that they would feel like their voices were heard and that they could see the response. And so we had peers um, facilitate those along with other clinical staff um, and had peers also participate in them um, for support. We also had our peers participate in the monthly affinity group meetings um, that were designed to educate peers um, around quality improvement. We also have them participate in our New York Links trainings. I can't impress upon people the importance of utilizing other systems for training your staff around quality improvement. We don't have to do the work ourselves. There are plenty of collaboratives um, with experts to provide that training, which has been extremely helpful. Next slide. So this is some of our spot fire data just along the way showing some of the progress. Um, we did quarterly progress reports for our teams and for CQII. Um, we were able by the end of the project to um, improve viral load suppression to the 15% mark, um, which we were thrilled about. Next slide. This is just another um, example of one of the graphs that 
you can utilize in the CQII website to track your data and show your progress along the way. Next slide. So there were many lessons learned. Um, I think, again, that cultural change takes time and collaboration. And so really using um, multiple sources to integrate the approach throughout all of our projects and work was key. Um, we did discuss regularly with um, people living with their lived experience, um, groups for feedback. That was so important to kind of check in with them throughout the project. We recognize that you really have to be flexible and be ready to kind of add something new so that when the organization came out with, they were gonna do de-escalation training, we wanted to be on that training team because it, it supported the project that we were working on. When they implemented the language of caring training that was really about verbal and nonverbal communication and effectively welcoming patients throughout their visit, we joined in the training team because it supported our project. So it was really important to be able to capitalize on things that kind of came along throughout the time period. We maintained a schedule of meetings and this was key to keep us on task because as someone um, commented earlier, it is a lot of work, but it's well worth it. We also, um, we were able to have leadership support, which is absolutely essential. And another component that's so important is having cheerleaders. You need people to keep the group motivated, keep them on task and, and keep the work going. We absolutely learned that social determinants of health continue to be the greatest barrier um, in really um, making those changes in viral load suppress suppression. And we definitely need um, interdepartment and interagency collaboration at a macro level. We just recently entered into a housing collaborative for a high priority group with the AIDS Institute and um, other organizations in the five boroughs to really look at the impact of housing on viral load suppression. And so really looking at that macro level system and, and how can we better collaborate with the housing programs in order to serve our patients better. We really embedded that approach into organizational structures, like I said, around training and documentation. Um, and that was key really for sustainability. And, and we saw the fruits of our labor that the awareness and knowledge um, really does promote that harm reduction lens um, that the staff use. And we would hear it in our case conferences and in the questions that patients asked and in the conversations they had with patients. And so really QI projects are a lot of hard work, but it, they help to build unity and it improves care overall. So it's well worth it. Next slide. And here are the team members um, who participated. There are email addresses. You can feel free to email us if you have any questions. And again, it really took a lot of people across a lot of departments to collaborate and really have this positive effect. Thank you. So I just wanted to, Lisa, thank you, representative, not only of your team, but of the other 83 uh, Rhine Ride programs that started with our collaborative journey. You, you really demonstrated that um, the importance of continuously improving the iterative learning. So I want to thank you again for all the hard work and benefiting the, the patients that you see across all your networks, and in this case, the specific two programs that were part of this collaborative. So thank you. Thank you. I, wanted to hopefully you learned a lot about that it's what this collaborative was all about and if you go to the next slide i think i hope we can leave this a little bit on an important note that we all believe that creating equity will end the hiv epidemic we do know from my and my data that nine out of ten clients with hiv are meeting optimal health outcomes 
So it means that one out of 10 does not. And I think to really understand the characteristics of the clients that are not virally suppressed is very important. And that's why I think that the, the needs of those patients may be different than other needs of other clients. And so I think so that going back to social determinants of health, I think that it's really important to really address them to, to benefit clients locally and nationally. Um, so it really can end the epidemic. On the personal, I feel that this collaborative um, really iterated the importance of involving, engaging people with HIV in planning improvement activities in designing them and really co-produce. And that was a really important step. And I think the other lesson for me was to really use data for improvement look at the data, figure out which intervention is most important, make adjustments to it, look at data again, whether your change that you, that you employed was in fact an improvement. And the only way we know that there's a difference between a change and improvement is looking at data. And so there are lots of resources available. And lastly, I just wanna leave you with the idea that take advantage of the many offerings that uh, we have available to you. Do not start to reinvent the wheel every time you think about, oh, we should you know, address this and that. Look around, um, call us, contact us, Lisa and many other programs. Um, I think by taking advantage of what others have done before you will hopefully uh, kind of uh, make and show you a path forward and something that's really important to us. Next slide, please. We want you just to highlight on the next slide about the Ryan White Conference, some other workshops that we have available to you. Um, take advantage. Um, we have a um, couple more um, sessions and I think they occur at the same time. So maybe you wanna look at the recording um, of that that will be available after the conference. Whether you wanna learn a little bit more about advanced QI tools, um, things that are really important um, to learn. So more like what Lean and Six Sigma has told us also about the patient voices and uh, particularly you hear some of the best practices available to you. And lastly, about PROMS and PREMS. So those, that stands for patient reported outcome measures and patient reported experience measures. The idea about incorporating the voices and elevating the voices of patients in the design of improvement activities, something that either can focus on quality of life, well-being, but also ex enhancing the experience of the, um, of the patient visits that would lead hopefully to uh, patients coming back um, for additional visits and to really be engaged because we all know that, um, that this relationship that exists within the provider and the patient is very important and the, the meetings and the, and the meetings throughout the visits are really important. The next slide I think shows us the, um, the contact information. So we hope that you can uh, reach out to us. We're also gonna put, copy and paste this into the, um, in the chat room during the session. And um, with that, I just wanted to conclude the, our presentation. Um, I think we have plenty of, uh, of time to, um, to talk a little bit more about some of the, we're looking forward for your question and answers. And with that, we're going to conclude our recording for today. And we're looking forward for the many questions we will get for you in our live part of our segment. With that, um, again, a, a quick reminder, if you want to receive clinical education um, credits, um, continuing education credits, please um, uh, follow the link here on the website. We're also going to put it into the chat room. With that, we're going to officially conclude our recording. I want to thank Lisa and Michelle for, for all the hard work um, on, on this collaborative. And with that, I want to thank you for participating and hang on for a couple more minutes for our Q&A, which we are happy to respond to many of the questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Lisa? Okay. I do hear, there's a little, I hear a little bit of background noise, but that's maybe related to the, um, maybe can get the encore recording 
I hear a little bit background, but that may be just. But you're right, Clemens. I do too. So I don't know. I know. Could it be? Doubt it's mine. Uh, Bobby was Lisa. Okay. So I, I just muted him. Wonderful. Before we begin our question and answer session, we would like to thank our presenters for addressing this timely and interesting topic. At this time, we will post questions from attendees that we have been collecting throughout the presentation. Please note that you may still submit questions using the chat feature. So I, I think Clements, you've already responded earlier for a comment. So I'm gonna try and see if there are any more here. I wanted to start, I think you're referring probably to, I guess it was Melissa. Who Melissa, had... that's correct. Yeah. And I think, Melissa, I think you bring up a good point. And I think that's something, and maybe Lisa and others should chime in here, is that disparities creating equity is always the question where. What is the one group that we should focus our efforts on? Um, you know, we know that nine out of 10 are virally suppressed. So what's the one group we should focus on? And, and I think that the, and one of the resources I pointed Melissa to, is our disparity calculator. Um, where, uh, it's a very simple looking um, the calculator is in Excel where you can enter your virus suppression data as it relates to housing, um, substance use, uh, mental health and age, and then basically put in a numerator denominator for the respective viral uh, denominator in terms of virus suppression. And it will tell you according to four or five disparities um, measures whether or not there are actually um, disparities occurring or not. And I think that's a really important step in that journey. And other, Melissa, I think sometimes we get overwhelmed by the many options. And I think what I learned in quality improvement is you have to start small and you have to start somewhere. So I would say pick one group that you feel is representative of those patients that are not virally suppressed and we certainly recognize there are many more than the four we focused on. Um, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to come up what, why you have chosen, for instance, in your case, substance use as the focus, and what was the thought process, and who did you engage in your program to come to that conclusion? Sure, and we really, we did the, the calculator as well. Um, and we also just looked at our own data. Um, in one of my earlier slides, I talked about how we looked at our mental health and substance use um, ratios across the three regions and, and really noted that they were both much higher in New York City than in the other two regions. And when we looked at the number of patients um, who had substance use disorders, it really became clear to us um, that this was an important area to try to focus on. We could have done any one of the four um, areas, mental health, substance use, aging, and certainly housing. Um, so, so there was a lot of discussion around which did we feel we should focus on and, and where we should um, try to get the, the most impact. And, and it really you know, involved a, a cross section of team members to talk about that. And we also felt like if we focused our energy on any one of those, that it would have a positive impact on the others as well. Really, when, when you focus anywhere, that focus really helps to make a shift. And I think that's a really important point, Lisa. Thanks for bringing it up because I often I, I think that we, it is a journey. And I think often that the lessons learned, for instance, you started with substance use and the art theory was a complementary, and certainly that applies to many more patients. And, and I think that's a really important lesson learned is that you strengthen your quality improvement muscle um, and that certainly then applies to other um, subpopulations as well. Another quick item I've heard from many is that you do a data drill down. Um, you basically take your data, only focus on those that are not virus suppressed on your most recent data and really do a drill down according to the many factors you can think of, whether it's age, whether it's other factors, and then try to determine and consider on that list also other things, such as mental health, housing, poverty, maybe you know many other factors that come to mind and look at them. And you will never find one 
one group only that will have all the you know if you focus on this you fix the world but i think it will be an important step and and then you have to use some judgment and, it, and it, for me don't make the perfect the enemy of the good in other words don't wait for this one group before you do anything it's better to start with one group that makes sense such as mental health or substance use because it will impact your patient cohort So I have <clears throat> from Joshua, going back to the point on a walk-in policy that was implemented, I agree that it is helpful in creating a more open environment, but how did clinics manage this while also maintaining regular clinic flow? For example, each social worker with the clinic I work with has a caseload of roughly 225 to 300 patients. In that, our schedules, pending action items, etc., are already maxed out at times. What are recommendations have been made to create this open door environment? Well, I think some of the things have to do with how we interact with patients. And so we really looked at um, a number of things right from security and front desk. And so how people are greeted initially, um, we implemented the language of caring, uh, train the trainer. So it really focused on some of those basic skills that we always need to be cognizant of. So our nonverbal communication, how we address people using proper pronouns, um, having eye contact, explaining to people when there was a wait, um, rather than waiting until someone was agitated, we implemented a few things around how do we communicate when a provider is running behind and apologize. And, um, and then some of it was also during that workflow, who was bringing the patient from the waiting room to the um, treatment room or to the provider and, and how that interaction took place so that you felt like you were being respectfully addressed and, and, and really kind of chatted with so that you felt comfortable and welcome and that you weren't just another number. And, and I think sometimes, you know, we just have to explain some of that, um, that wait time to make people feel a little bit more respected around their time wait. Um, we can't always do something about the wait time, um, but, but we can kind of communicate it so that people aren't quite so agitated. And then I think some of the other things were just um, really looking at how the waiting room was designed, how notices are posted, you know, especially with the pandemic, there's plexiglass everywhere. And, and how do you really use that environment to be um, welcoming um, and, and directing people? You know, were there good directions and signs that people knew how to find the lab or the waiting room um, and things like that? Thank you, Lisa. I think you. I, I think you maybe something related maybe to your connection because um, I'm just muting you. Thank you. Um, thank you. No more comments on my part. Okay, so there is another question um, from um, Thompson regarding language of caring and distillation. Uh, did you create or use resource? We used resources. Um, we have a very large um, training institute since we have 2000 staff. And so we were able to contract with um, language of caring to come in and do a train the trainer. And then we have um, about 30 of our staff implementing it's a like an eight module training program and so that's how we were able to do kind of ongoing training with all of the staff 
And the same thing um, with de-escalation. And now there are so many things that are also um, through video. And so we've been doing kind of a combination. Um, but, you know, it, it just made sense to try to do some outside resourcing um, because there's just so much going on and, and we could have um, greater consistency. All right, we have another question from um, Angie. How did your walk-in policy impact your staff and how did you work through those issues? So Lisa did not necessarily work on the also called open access intervention. So I, I will put into the chat um, another um, resource there. Um, and what basically open access means is that, and I, just to clarify that, it is basically that you set specific times aside during the day that are not preoccupied by pre-scheduled um, appointments. You rather tell the patient, come in when you're ready. And they can come in on Monday, they come in on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but you have enough spots available throughout the day to absorb those patients coming in. Um, it actually um, has been shown, there's a lot of literature about this intervention, um, and it's a very patient-centered approach um, versus more uh, scheduling. It's easy for us as staff. It's a very you know, staff-centered approach. But uh, and it, it 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 we can give you and Angie, if you send private this text to your email address, we can put you in touch with some of the programs who have um, entertained that idea, who have worked through it, and there are lots of successes in HIV as well as RANRAC programs. It really helped the patient to come in when they are ready, rather than we tell them, you know, please come back in six months. And it is often easy for those that have calendars and schedules, uh, but it's very hard if your life, you know, has many different barriers thrown at you. So Angie, just uh, please follow up with us and by sharing your address. We have another question from Karen. The undetectables program is great. How were, how are you able to find the incentives? There, there is a policy uh, from Ryan White that, that stipulates how Ryan White funds could, under very specific circumstances, be used as incentives. I know I, since I'm not representing HRSA here, so I would refer back to their documentation. It's well documented. So funds can be made available to, as incentives. Um, obviously, cash wouldn't be, um, but there are mechanisms to do so. Um, and Lisa, since we have you here, when you, when we use the word incentives, often we just go straight to monetary incentives. You know, like what's the cash equivalent? But I think. Um, in your case, there were also non-monetary incentives. I think your art program or we to connect is a really important part. We know that many people over 50 in terms of Ryan White patients, uh, you know, express loneliness as one of the key factors. And so I think there are other mon um, non-monetary incentives to bring patients into programs. And I think you mentioned some of you, but do you want to talk a little bit how you were able to fund some of those activities? Um, some of those activities, since it's it's really um, building the program and building um, opportunities for our patients, um, it can be funded through um, program revenue. Um, we also um, have built it into um, some of those um, uh, program lines so that there's supplies. So there's art supplies and there's um, food supplies because you know we also know that uh, consumers like to come in and also socialize over, you know, lunch or refreshments. And so it made sense to have some snacks and, and lunch um, for the groups. Um, we've also done some things just to truly make it possible for people to attend. Transportation is expensive. And so um, in the city programs, we provide Metro cards. Um, and so if they get in, they get two to take home. So they get home and then they have another one to get back in for the next group. 
Thank you, Lisa and Clements. And actually, if I can speak on behalf of the HRSA, what I will, I'm suggesting would be to work with your project officers uh, for each part um, around the incentives, the allowability and allocability of the incentives. Uh, moving on to another question uh, uh, from Thompson, regarding case conferencing, how did medical staff respond when this intervention not often reimbursed by managed care? I'm trying to think about, I, I have to probably think through a little bit about what scenario they are, are not. At the end of the day, um, I'm, I, I, maybe I, it has to be a little bit more concrete to me to really fully answer this. I think the question to me is, we need to find creative answers for the patients that are not virally suppressed. And so I think if, if if there's no reimbursement for a specific type of service that's needed, access to routine, safe food, for instance, um, I think we need to look and work with external stakeholders that historically may not have worked with you and build alliances and build partnerships with other programs, whether they're right, right funded or not, um, local communities. Um, I know many programs have reached out to nearby churches and faith-based programs that uh, provide, for instance, access to routine food um, and safe food. And I, I think that's, a, that's another uh, way to think about. I don't think there's a distinction between medical staff and non-medical staff in terms of um, accessing, you know, making a distinction about reimbursement or not, but that's just my experience. Um, I think, I mean, Lisa, do you have any other take on this answer or this question by Thompson? Sure. Um, if it's referring to case conferencing time for providers, um, we really look at having those HIV specialists on some funded grant. And so that um, kind of covers the time that they're not seeing patients. And so, you know, it's a very small amount of their time. And so it's, you know, one week, I mean, one hour a week, um, say for, you know, each of those sites or one and a half hours. And so we do fund their time through um, a variety of grants. Karen, I, I um, appreciate your comment about the idea of non-monetary incentives. And, and I, I think we sometimes, because we are, Nonprofits often money, you know, is a very important driver, but I think we sometimes think have to think beyond that. And there are more motivations for a client to come in. And um, since we, we spent a lot of time thinking in recent weeks and months about HIV and aging, and I think a statistic, if I'm not mistaken, and please don't quote me on this, that three out of four um, patients create loneliness and isolation as a key part of being individual living with HIV 50 years and older. And I believe that seven out of 10 uh, live by themselves, um, meaning don't have a partner to live with. And, and I think if you think about that statistic, it is not being solved by money. It's about solving, creating, um, you know, opportunities, whether that's peer groups, um, peer groups um, and coming together. And I think that may be solved by really not, it certainly staff time for sure, because somebody has to organize groups, somebody has to get them together, and, and maybe somebody locally can fund any kind of uh, materials that are needed for coming together. But I think that's just one. Um, and I think if you listen very carefully through focus groups and listen to patients, there may be other things we can help them with to be engaged in care and, and also care uh, about other things that would increase the quality of life around them. Thank you, Clements. We have another question and we have a few minutes. What are similarities or differences between case conferences and multidisciplinary rounds that medical centers use to staff patients prior to clinic days? That's a great question. Thank you. That's a really important one. And I I may not, and Lisa, you chime in as well. I, I may not have the perfect description in definitional um, background here. Case conferencing versus a morning huddle about all incoming patients is the following. Case conferencing focuses 
on a few clients that you identify based on predetermined um, criteria, such as all patients who are newly enrolled in your program. Because if I'm newly enrolled, I'm more likely to fall out of care because I don't know Lisa and I don't know the program, but then we're, if they stay in the program for two, three years, then we'll likely come back because they hopefully feel at home at Lisa's program. And so case conference and focus on a few. You may not be able to discuss more than two, three clients per hour because you wanna hear from everybody's perspective. We also know, and the SPINS program have been very instrumental in the following finding that when patients talk about their healthcare, they may tell different, I wouldn't say different stories, but they, they, they're articulating their um, life circumstances differently to different providers based on authority, based on the familiarity, based on the connection and human connection they have with different staff. And so I think case conference bring those different perspectives together. Multidisciplinary rounds, huddles in the morning would really address all patients coming in a day and then talk at very safety. So the number of clients that you want will discuss that is a pretty pretty high number to go through and anticipate the needs of clients coming in. So, oh, we have two new clients coming in today. Let's be sure that they get the forms up front when it's in the waiting room. Can the peer go out and greet them while they are sitting to wait for their medical appointment to make them feel welcome? Lisa, do you have any other thoughts about the, the comments about the case conferencing versus multiple smear rounds? Well, I think for the case conferencing, it's a little bit more in depth around all of the key medical indicators that we need to have patients meet um, in the standards of care and that we are systematically reviewing all patients every six months. Um, our interdisciplinary um, treatment team meetings tend to focus on patients who are um, shared across those disciplines and may be really struggling, or that it's, um, it, it's it, it, focus, it has a different focus rather than all of their medical indicators. And, and it, I guess it depends on the way the program is running um, those two different um, programs or you know, meetings. We have about three minutes. So let me read the thank yous. And then we have one more question for Lisa. Uh, the thank you thank, uh, from uh, Diana. Thank you for providing so many specific examples. I uh, really appreciate all your hard QI related work to improve client health outcomes, but particularly appreciated hearing about how to ensure we are caring and showing respect for clients, language of care and de-escalation, that's tra training. Um, that's from Diana. Thank you. And we have one more question from uh, Stephanie for Lisa. Was your program completely implemented through in-house resources or did you have strategic par partnerships that helped you carry out your program goals? So the driving force was um, a key group of uh, about a dozen people primarily the um, interdisciplinary treatment team for the HIV programs in those two sites. And it actually also included the hep C programs and the prep staff um, along with the providers. Um, but we, we really depended on external resources for a lot of the training. Um, the AIDS education and training um, program really provided ongoing um, trainings for providers, for case managers, for peers, and for medical staff. And then we, um, you know, much of the training was really from external sources. Also, one of our coaches was from the Harm Reduction Coalition, and he was an invaluable resource um, for gaining um, some specific trainings and, and some resources for us to just incorporate. Um, so the coaching is really helpful um, because they come with their area of expertise based on, you know, your QI project. All right, we are at 44 right now. And if you have um, presenters, if it is, uh, I, I did see Clements have posted your email addresses. If there are any unanswered questions in your minds currently, I think you're welcome to email our presenters today uh, to get your responses and answers. 
Um, so at 12.44, I think um, I would like to say thank you to everyone for your participation today as part of the HIV AIDS Bureau's efforts to provide you with timely topics and interesting speakers. We appreciate you filling out the session evaluations at the end of each session. If you are seeking continuing education credits, please complete the additional evaluation for credit. To access these evaluations, please return to the session page within the platform and click on the blue evaluation links. Thank you again for joining us and have a great afternoon.